Hi, and uh, welcome to this program back here at the Ashland Senior Center. For those of you who don't, haven't met me, my name is Arthur Bergeron. I'm an elder law attorney. I work at Myrick O'Connell. There are 70 of us, 40 in Worcester, 20 in Westboro, which is where I am, and 10 in Boston, biggest firm outside of Boston. Um, and all the work I do is in elder law. Now, I've done a lot of presentations here over the last about 10 years, mostly just focused on law, but I decided for this fall, I'd focus more on my friends Frank and Mary. You've all met them before. Frank and Mary, their kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Goal is live in their house until they die, be buried in the backyard. That's their goal. And if they're in Ashland, they want to stay here. So what I wanted to do was to give you a kind of a comprehensive sense of what Frank and Mary should be doing at various points in their lives if that's what their goal is. And so we're going to talk about Frank and Mary today and, and not at... at um, these more, this is more like Frank and Mary at 80. We're going to talk more about Frank and Mary at 70. So that they're just retiring, and, and, and we're going to be talking with a set of players whom Frank and Mary and you need to know. Um, we're going to talk to Christine Alessandro. She's been with us before. She's the executive director of Bay Path Elder Services, which is the regional entity, uh, the regional nonprofit, which is the, the funnel through which all money for seniors comes from the federal government and the state government. They, their original program was Meals on Wheels. So they were created about the time way back that the Older Americans Act was passed by Lyndon Johnson. We are actually old enough to remember Lyndon Johnson, right? Uh, Jeff Obeter who is this, has got this wonderful, uh, uh, she's really here for two reasons. Um, he has a wonderful organization, organization called Seniors Helping Seniors, which is a home care well, he's going to talk to you about what they do. It's, it's a kind of home care entity that is really uh, where all of his employees are seniors. So one of the reasons why he's going to be talking to you is that if Frank and Mary are 70, they may want to be working for him to be participating in all of this. But he's going to be talking about all of these things. And we're going to be talking to Sarah Burke. Uh, Sarah is a wonderful uh, geriatric care manager uh, who lives here. You live here in a, a local, lives here in Ashland, right? I always, this, these are the people that I always suggest that you meet. And you always want to talk to these people before there's a problem so you can get a kind of a sense of who they are and what they do and find out if there are any programs that might be of interest to you. And, and, and you're, we're going to be talking about Frank and Mary to start off with at age 70. And then we're going to talk about them a little bit more at age 80. So at 70, we're figuring they're both pretty healthy. Once again, that just for background, these are their assets. They got a house here. It's worth $300,000. I know that's a little house now because of where the prices have gone. Uh, they've got savings of about $300,000, and Frank has an IRA uh, worth about $200,000. So their total assets are worth about $800,000. Um, Frank has Social Security. That's his, no pension. Social Security, $2,000 a month. Mary has Social Security of $1,000 a month. Obviously, they're getting something off of Frank's IRA and the savings account, but they're okay. They're all doing fine. They just retired. And Frank's life expectancy at this point is 14.40 years. Now, a lot of times I use some of these numbers and people say, God, that seems like really long. I thought that life expectancy was like in the seventies or something. Well, if you're zero, then, then maybe it is. But if you're 70, that's your life expectancy if you're Frank. And if you're Mary, your life expectancy is two years greater than that, 16, a little over 16 years. And I think that the, the, the challenge, and by the way, so, so I'm turning 70 in January. This is one of the reasons I did this presentation. This is becoming very meaningful for me here. So the main thing to do, though, uh, for, and I keep trying to do it for myself and my wife, she's going to be 69 next year, you know, and for you, is when you're 70 to be saying to yourself to, to not look at your life as 70 as the last year of the 70 years that you just spent. Right, which is easy to do, right? Oh, you know, I don't feel as good as I did before. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah, I get all that. Except that those years are all gone. They're just gone. So the question really is, how are those next 15 years going to look, right? And what are the things you need to do in order to make those as good as possible? Because we all know people who have gone through some of those years, and they haven't been good, right? And, and, to, and sometimes that's just because that's what God said, you know? And sometimes it's, but sometimes it's things that you can kind of deal with, right? So that's kind of the goal here is to be kind of focusing on, on, on that. So the question when you're 70 then is, who are the people 
that you need to be talking to or you should be talking to right off the bat, right? Well, the first one, obviously, is you need to be coming to the Senior Center. Now, as you know, these programs get taped because a lot of the audience for this is people who don't come to the Senior Center to tell them they should come to the Senior Center, right? Because it's the place, because the folks here are going to be able to tell you about all of the programs that you're going to be wanting to think about. You're going to want to talk to the Senior Center. You're going to want to meet a geriatric care manager. Uh, and that's why I'm going to introduce you to one. You can meet anyone. This isn't necessarily an ad for her. She's convenient. She's in Ashland. But, but you know, you, you need to talk to one. And you need to know the ASAP. The ASAP. Aging Services Access Point. The ASAP. That is Bay Path Elder Services. Um, um, Christine's agency, Bay Path, is one of 26 here in Massachusetts. Um, they have divided the entire state up. So every community in Massachusetts has an ASAP. But this is the one you have to know that you really need to know. Why the Senior Center? Well, you know, you know, there's fun and games here. That's great. There's the exercise class and there's yoga and there's a bunch of stuff. There's food. Actually, you have more than most senior centers in terms of there always being free food you can take home in addition to the meals that you can get here. There's help, right? There's help with major issues. What are two of the big ones? Taxes and your Medicare, right? The, that the, one of the greatest things this state has done has been to develop the SHINE program through which you have trained volunteers who are trained to help you figure out not only what your drug plan is going to look like, because you know you renew that every year, but also what your Medicare plan should be like. Because many people still are not aware of the fact that when you're not, there isn't just one plain vanilla size of Medicare. There isn't just Medicare A and B. There are all these different Medicare Advantage plans. You can move from one plan to the other every year, right? It doesn't make any difference if your health has changed. Remember, this is not real health insurance. This is, you know, there, or this actually is, though. This is what Obamacare aspired to be. No pre-existing conditions. If, you, if your situation changes from year to year, you may want to have a different insurance for the upcoming year. Your drugs may have changed. You may feel you're not as healthy. You may want to just change plans, right? They're going to help you be able to do that. There are educational programs. Here we are. This is an educational program. As you know, there are a lot of others. And I think really important, there are these opportunities to volunteer. Because one of the things I've really come to appreciate, I, we're, we're like kind of in this together, right? You know, I mean, we're in that age bracket. Our kids are all over the place. Maybe you're lucky and they're close, but boy, that's getting rare and rare. And if, even if they are close, they're busy. They're really busy, right? They're trying to deal with their kids. There's a million things. And the older you get, the more you're going to, if you want to stay in Ashland, the more you're going to be relying on people like people in this room, right? So you want to be seeing if you can help them out now, and maybe they'll help you out later. So that's the senior center. Um, and then you want to meet a geriatric care manager. So Sarah's going to talk about that. But I'm just going to add something. So uh, the point of a geriatric care manager is to help you to, first of all, have some other person other than just you and your kids talking about how you're doing and how you might be doing and how you could be doing things better, right? Whether it's because there are some things in your house that you could improve in order to make it safer, because you know that's the whole story here, don't want to fall down. You can be really old, but don't fall down. It's a one-way trip, you get that broken hip, game's over, right? So to talk about that, to talk about whether at some point you may want to help have some assistance in the home, as opposed to having your daughter come over all the time, and she's not really complaining that much, but you know, after a while it gets old, you know? So to try to, and to, so to just to try to figure things out, right? So that's, a geri that's what the geriatric care manager is about. So with that introduction, Sarah Burke. And you have to come all the way over here. We tried to do this, and of course, I should have told everybody before I started, you ought to turn off your phone, because otherwise it might ring right in the middle of a presentation, right? Thank you. Here you go. So as he said, I, my name is Sarah Bork. I am a registered nurse, a certified dementia care practitioner, and a certified care manager. So backing up, what are, what are care managers? Who are we? We are healthcare providers, um, people who have worked in the healthcare industry as nurses, social workers, physical therapists, occupational therapists for many years in a number of different settings. Um, 
we then, I always lose my train of thought. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. Um, I'm having a <laughs> yes. I'm having a yes. <laughs> we we yeah yes yes we we all do. Um, many of us, although not all of us, are um, certified, which means we've subjected ourselves to an additional exam, which looks at our areas of expertise, which include crisis intervention, health and disability, financial, housing, family, local resources, advocacy, and legal issues. Uh, what that means is that we are partners with you. We are uh, guides. We make recommendations. We always start with what do you want your life to look like and then help you get there. Um, we help you find resources. We, if there's a crisis, if your family is far away and you end up in the emergency room and you don't want to be in the emergency room alone, we're there with you. Medical appointments, we're there with you. So at age 70, ideally, Frank and Mary are pretty healthy. So there's not a whole lot that I would be doing for Frank and Mary at this time other than maybe taking some inventory with them. Uh, what are their health issues? Are there things they can do to improve their health so that they can really enjoy this next journey, this next part of their journey? Um, what are their plans? Do they want to stay in the home they're living in now? Does the home work for them? Probably at 70, it works for them. But if there are a lot of steps and their mobility is not quite what it was or they have a bad knee, a bad hip, things might be starting to get a little bit more difficult. So we might be thinking about, well, is it staying at home and making some changes in the home to make it work better and then connecting you with people who can help you do that? Or is it maybe we want to go into a retirement community or an assisted living facility, helping you think about what's important within those types of communities? What's important to you? Do you want it to be close to your kids if your kids are close by? Do you want it to be a, lot, a big facility, a small facility, things like that? Um, one of the other things that we always emphasize right at the beginning is to make sure you have all your paperwork in place. Um, and what I mean mostly is a healthcare proxy and a power of attorney. That way if something happens that you're not expecting, you have people there who can catch you and take care of your bills, make your medical decisions, that sort of thing, if you're not able to do that. We'll help you have conversations or have thoughts about, well, if I were to have a stroke, if I were to have a heart attack, what would I want to happen? And that way, and then we encourage you to talk to your healthcare proxy about those things so they also know what your wishes are. Um, I think for Frank and Mary at 70, that's probably about it. So Josh is next. So Josh Obiter is the, um, works at Seniors Helping Seniors, which is one of the resources that we often go to. It's a really, it's a nice agency where people come and help you out with things. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thanks, Sarah. Um, so it says Doug, but I'm actually Josh. Uh, we like to um, trick everybody. No, uh, Doug Peck is not able to be here today, so I am filling in for him. Uh, but I actually oversee seniors helping seniors and pleasantries adult day services. Um, and as Sarah was saying, Seniors Helping Seniors is a resource to help people um, remain independent in their own home or in a community in which they're living. And Pleasantries is an adult day program in Marlboro. Um, it's a social model that um, accommodates guests every day living with cognitive uh, impairment and memory issues uh, and allows um, their care providers, their family members, a respite opportunity. Um, so I think as um, we, as Ar Arthur started this morning saying that everyone really wants to stay at home. A lot of you have lived in Ashland for many, many years. This is where your community is. This is where your friends are. And this is where you're most comfortable with. In order to um, remain in your home uh, and home is a you know 
an interesting word because uh, home can can mean a lot of different things to people. But in order to stay um, where you're most comfortable, where you're most familiar, you do need to do some planning. And at the end of the day, everybody needs help at some point or another in their life. And people need help really throughout the lifespan, if you think about it, um, with child care, to um, you know, caring for pets, through for for caring for aging parents, for caring one for yourself. Um, it, it really it, it's just part of human nature that we all do need help at one point or another. But what is going to be that precipitating factor? There can be a whole host of issues, as you probably are aware, that come up in life that um, prevent you from being as independent as you once were. So. As Frank and Mary are 70 years old, um, hopefully um, you're just in the planning stage. You're in the planning stage for what may need to come to modify your home. You're in the planning stage for getting your legal matters in order. But you're also in the planning stage for what kind of support am I going to be looking for if a situation comes up. Um, so a new diagnosis. Um, there are plenty of diagnoses that people encounter. So if a new diagnosis comes up, what are you going to do to ensure that you have help? That could be a, you know, a cognitive impairment diagnosis where you're less cognitively intact, less able to make decisions on your own behalf, or it could be something more physically limiting like Parkinson's disease, for example. So what happens when you need assistance. Um, some of the diseases that may come up, think about macular degeneration or vision impairment that prevent you from being as independent in terms of getting around. You may need help driving places. You may need help running errands. Um, all of these things that, that come up uh, later in life that prevent you from being as independent also create this sense of isolation because our worlds inevitably become a little bit smaller as we age. Friends move away, friends pass away, family is dispersed as Arthur mentioned earlier on. And if you're no longer driving or you're, no, you're not as mobile as you once were, it's a lot more challenging to get connected and be a part of your respective community. So not only are you dealing with a potential um, debilitating diagnosis, but you're also more isolated. So the types of helps that are available, um, there are kind of two buckets of um, services that um, we, we tried to break down for you. In terms of traditional caregivers, um, a traditional caregiver is often someone who's certified, someone who's a certified nursing assistant, a home health aide, a personal care attendant. And um, when Christine talks later on, BayPath can certainly help uh, connect you to those types of resources in terms of people that are able to provide that hands-on care. Hands-on care could be helping with a shower, helping you get in and out of a vehicle. It could be uh, helping you in the bathroom. It could be uh, helping you with dressing and other types of personal care needs. So um, we often um, call upon traditional caregivers for helping with activities of daily living, things that you and I may or may not think about each day. Getting up out of bed, getting into the shower, preparing a meal, feeding oneself, things that we take for granted is um, as, as a diagnosis you know, presents itself, um, a personal care attendant, a home health aide is, is the appropriate place to go if you need help with those traditional tasks. Um, seniors Helping Seniors is more in that non-traditional bucket where we provide companions, um, people who are going to serve more as a friendly neighbor, but who certainly can assist you with the day-to-day -day operations of your life, getting to and from doctor's appointments, going to the grocery store, meal prep, going to your favorite uh, lecture that you're no longer able to go to on your own. So a companion is, is often someone who's not certified, someone who has um, the case of seniors helping seniors, someone that has a, a, a well and en rich life experience, someone who has been through um, a similar number of years of life as you, the people that are in their 60s, 70s, and even 80s that are uh, able to assist you with um, your life and enhancing really your quality of life. 
So it really does um, take a village in terms of, um, you know, getting supports. And often that's why Seniors Helping Seniors partners with uh, organizations that can provide that more traditional care, because often it is really that blend in that middle that people do need. They need the help with those daily tasks, but they also need that companionship, that, that, that person that can really engage and connect with them on a social emotional level. And um, you may have read, you may have not read, but there's more and more research talking about isolation being just as bad for you as smoking a pack of cigarettes each day. So we know that, um, especially in the suburbs where you have less access to public transportation, isolation is real and we want to try and combat that. So I think with that said, I'm going to uh, turn it over back to Arthur. So thank you very much, Jeff. And, and, and Jeff was, was stepping in for Doug Peck who spends a lot of time in this area with seniors helping seniors. Jeff, or Jeff is actually his boss, right? He actually has, uh, runs the entire organization. So, and I think there are several things that, that, that Jeff said, they're just really, really important. I think the, this issue of talking to somebody, well, talking to somebody like Sarah to try to figure out how to deal with issues you may be facing, but you, know, you heard that magic thing, the, set, the maculogy generation, the issue of the car, there may be a point at which you just say, you know, I really don't feel like you're doing this car anymore. You know, I mean, I can kind of still do it. My eyes aren't as good as they used to be, but you don't want to be totally isolated as a result. Well, you know, this may be an alternative that you can look at in terms of a way that you can get around to where you need to get around, even though you're not driving the car, you know? So it may be the best of both of both worlds. So I think Jeff's really, really got some important things that, that they can offer. And thank you very much to Sarah. Christine Alessandro, has been in this area like for a long time. <laughs> We've been doing these forever, um, almost forever, and and has been running this agency for a long time, and can and can really give you a sense of what the programs are, and those folks can give you a sense of what the programs are across a whole host of issues, and but it can talk to you specifically about what you might be wanting to talk to them about if you're 70. And once again, one of the big things if you're if you're younger or still feeling great is volunteering. So, Christine. So, how many people have heard of Bay Path Elder Services? Raise your hand. Oh, just about everybody. Well, that's wonderful. So, do you think you might use the services of Bay Path tomorrow or the day after? Maybe, maybe not. Hopefully not, okay. Do you think of yourself as elderly? Nope. So we're going to be addressing that name change business. So 70 is the new 50, and since I'm 61, I'm hoping that, six, that 40, is, is 60 is the, 40 is the new 60. So why do you need Bay Path? Well, we're mostly known for Meals on Wheels, for the in-home services we provide, such as homemaking, personal care, but that's not all that we do. A large part of what we do is to provide opportunities for older adults, that's the term now, not seniors, it's older adults, and I'm an older adult, to remain active and engaged in your community. I mentioned we have a Meals on Wheels program. We deliver 500 meals a day in our communities. And that could not be done unless we had a large number of volunteers to deliver those. So someone like yourself who's still driving, who has a desire to give back to the community, you might want to be a Meals on Wheels driver, a volunteer, once a week, once every other week. Doesn't have to be every day. Healthy living programs. Who is afraid of a fall? I'm afraid of a fall. I know I have, I have osteoporosis. And I'm afraid if I fall, I'm going to break something. But we have a number of what are called evidence-based programs. An evidence-based program is a program that has been certified to be valid. So we have programs like a matter of balance, which assists in fear of falling. We have chronic disease self-management programs if you have chronic pain, if you have diabetes, if you have a chronic condition, this is a program that helps you learn 
how to manage that condition. These are programs that are available in the community. They're free for you. Usually they're six week sessions and they help you remain at home. They help you remain engaged. And the third is employment opportunities. We love having older adults employed in our organization, just like Josh does. So are there opportunities that we could provide to you? Might you wanna be an administrative assistant for 20 hours a week? Sometimes these come up, but these are things that help you remain engaged. So Bay Path Elder Services isn't only getting a meal delivered, it isn't only having in-home services, it's providing the opportunities to you at this point in your life because you have the time and because you want to do something. I always say, know us before you need us. If you know about us now, that's great. We have a lot of programs, but if you don't know about us, you might want to reach out and just learn about what we have. We can send you an information sheet. I always tell the example of my mother who lives in New Jersey. And I run an elder services agency up here. I really know my stuff. But when my mother had a bad fall in New Jersey and I went down there to help her, I knew nothing because I did not know the system in New Jersey. Up here we have something called Lifeline. Lifeline is where you hit the button and say, I've fallen and I can't get up. So I saw on the website for New Jersey, they have a Lifeline program. I thought that would be great for my mother, so I called them. And their first question was, does she have oil or electric? And I say, excuse me? Lifeline is their fuel assistance program in New Jersey. It's not push the button. That was a rude awakening. Also, if you're 70, what if you have an aging parent? You have an aging aunt and uncle that remain in the community. My mother had an aunt that lived to be 103. So, you know, our lifespan has really increased. You have an aging parent in Massachusetts and you want to know more about those services, call our information and referral department. Information and referral is free. We will get you the resources and the help that you need and help you identify what you think you might need. We have a caregiver program. It's a federally funded program at no cost to you. You, get, you can get training. We can refer you to support groups. We can give you education. We can give you support and assistance because we know that caregivers can get very overwhelmed and you need support along a caregiving journey, whether you're caring for an aging parent whether you're caring for a spouse. It doesn't matter. We also have in-home services, which you are probably familiar with. Homemaking, personal care, laundry, grocery shopping. And I always say Massachusetts is a wonderful state with the state-funded home care program. There is no income limit in the state home care program. Used to be there was an income limit. That income limit has, been, has gone by the wayside. So if you now have an annual income of $60,000 a year and you still have a need and you're over 60, you can qualify for the home care program. There will be a copay, but you can qualify. It used to be that there was a cap on how much you could make. That's gone by the wayside. So that's all information to remember in this wonderful new time of your life, whether you're caring for somebody or you're not caring for somebody and just want to have more information about what goes on in the area, just call us. We'll be happy to help. And now I turn it back to Arthur to talk about Frank and Mary. Thank you. So when you're 70 and you're Frank and Mary, there are a few things that you need to do, but not much. As a, you know, if you're talking to your lawyer, you, some, uh, some folks, you know, at 70 tend to, I say, get oversold on things that they need to do. The, 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 but you want to do some things, right? So first of all, if you're Frank and Mary, chances are you own everything that you own jointly with rights of survivorship. The effect of that is, the legal consequence of that is, that each of you owns 100% of the asset, whether it's your home or a bank account or whatever. One of you dies, that person's interest evaporates, the other person becomes the sole owner. So it may very well be, if you're Frank and Mary and your big issue is probate avoidance, you've already taken care of it if one of you dies. Well, what happens if the two of you die at the same time? Possible, unbelievably remote. I've been doing this for 42 years now. This has happened once that two people died at the same time. Actually, they were younger. 
you know, but it was a, a husband actually and husband and two or husband, wife and two kids. And the husband got home late from work and parked in the, the attached garage and apparently forgot to shut off the car and went in and went to bed and everybody died that night. Right. How often do you hear? So so the big issue, if, you, if your issue is if one of you dies, I want to make sure that there's no probate. You've already taken care of it. Right. If you're really worried about it because you're worried about what happens if the two of you have died, well, then you, you want to do something about creating a, rev a, a revocable and amendable trust. We do many of those, but we tell people you don't have to really until the first of the two of you has died. Um, asset protection. People regularly come in and talk about, about oh my God, I need to, we need to protect our assets in case we go to a nursing home. I'm going to talk about this a little bit later on, but as you've heard me say before, if you're married and you're Frank and Mary and you get the assets that they've got and one of you needs nursing home care, you can do all the things needed to qualify at the last minute. You don't have to do anything ahead of time, right? The main thing is if you're Frank and Mary's, you want to make sure uh, exactly as Sarah has said, that you want to stay in control. There are two simple documents to help you stay in control. The reason why, well, remember when we were growing up, if, if you, you, know, you, you had a heart attack, you know, you'd hear people had a heart attack and they died, you know, or people, or people had a stroke and they died. But you don't hear about, you know, you know how you rarely hear about that, right? So there's the statistic. In 1970, if you had a heart attack or a stroke, your likelihood of being dead within 14 days was 33%. That was a lot. In 2010, your likelihood of being dead in 14 days is 3%. That's what's changed. The technology has changed. The ambulance now shows up. The EMTs are there. There's the life flight. There's all this stuff. So chances are, if you have a serious event, you're not going to die. You're going to be a little bit diminished, though, maybe for a little while, maybe for a long while. In that case, you need somebody who is there who can take care of your legal affairs for you and somebody that can handle your, or make medical decisions for you if you can't make them yourself. So very briefly, no, raise your hand if you have a power of attorney. Raise your hand. Most people do. So I'm just going to, but I'm going to tell you, so go back and read it. I guarantee you, you haven't read it recently or at all. But you just went, you got to your lawyer, you got a power of attorney. Read it to make sure that a few things are there or not there. First, you want to make sure, especially if you're Frank and Mary and you've named your spouse as your attorney, which is typically what happens, right, that, that, that your spouse has the ability on your behalf to, make, to do unlimited giving to herself or to himself. If you don't have that and you have that stroke and I'm trying to qualify you for mass health because you're going to be in a nursing home for a while, and your wife needs to shift all of your assets out of your name into her name so that you can qualify, she's not going to be able to do that, right? So you want to check because most of these or many of these older powers of attorney don't have that or they have a cap on the giving. Often the, what, what is referred to as the federal estate tax maximum, which is now $15,000 a year. It's got no, he no help to me if I need to be trying to qualify you for mass health by shifting all of your assets to your spouse but the most she can shift or he can shift under the terms of your power of attorney is $15,000. That's not going to help me. So you want to check that. You also want to make sure there's an alternate. Many younger people, um, will sim Frank and Mary, will simply name each other. They won't name an alternate. You get to the point, you have to, ha at, this, at our age, you just have to have an alternate because you don't know. You get into an accident, you're both hurt. You need somebody else who can take care of things or your spouse goes into the hospital, you know, do you really want to be taking care of every, everything as opposed to just being in the hospital with your spouse, right? So you may want to name one of the kids. Their kids happen to be Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. You want to name, may name one of the kids. You can also name multiple people in a power of attorney. You could name all of your kids jointly and severally so that any one of them could take care of things for you if the other, one was, if the other ones weren't around. Healthcare proxy, same thing. The main thing is you may want to name your spouse. You probably already have, if, if, but you probably want to name an alternate so that if your, your spouse is not available or doesn't want to be dealing with the doctors and the nurses and looking at the charts and all that stuff, but just wants to be with you, that there's going to be an alternate who can deal with all that stuff. So that's everything you need to be doing, thinking about if you're 70 and you're Frank and Mary. If you're 80, if Frank and Mary are 80, now they've made it past the, through these 10 years and presumably they've been good years 
and now they're looking forward. Except the length of time they're looking forward to is less, right? Remember before they both had about 15 years left of life. Well, now they don't, right? They lived, and they lived 10 more years. Interestingly, their life expectancy um, only, um, only went down about five years, right? Or five or six years because before they were each, they were going to live about 15 more years now it looks like they're each going to live about 10 more years but that, and that's great but you know but it's getting closer you know so you want to be more sensitive to how you're living in terms of making these years as good as they can be because the likelihood keeps increasing that they're not going to be so hot so you need to be dealing with that also if you're Frank and Mary at that point when you're 80 it may be that somebody's having a problem Somebody may be having a cognitive problem. Somebody may be having some kind of health problem. So you need to start looking, if you're Mary, for example, at how you can stay independent, even though you're not feeling so great, right? And you want to be dealing with these same players, the ASAP, the senior center, the geriatric care manager. Are there things that you really need to be doing in that house, right, to, to, to fix it out in order to, to stay at home? Christine can probably tell you about one of, the pro one of the state programs that can actually loan you some money interest-free in order to do that, right? Um, do you just need a little bit of assistance at home? Do you want to talk to the geriatric care manager about, so who's around? You know, what are the agencies that are around? That's their job. One of the hardest things, how can, can you imagine just kind of lo looking blindly into what used to be the yellow pages? I don't know where you look now. I'm getting old. I don't know, right? But to try to find the right home care agency, do you have any idea about any of these home care agencies? That's her job, is to know them all, to know who works for them, how they work, to know who's got, who really delivers, you know, who's got an agency where the people don't show up. You need to know all of that stuff, right? Or are, is, there a point, is there that point at which you need to be looking at assisted living, for example, right? Is there the point at which because no matter what you do to your house, there's still going to be those stairs outside, chances are, and it's still going to snow out there in the winter, right? So your likelihood of getting hurt is just higher when you're in a single family house, right? One of the great things about assisted living is typically there's indoor walking space. You don't have to cook anymore. Maybe you love cooking, you know, but maybe you don't, you know, and you don't have to cook anymore if you don't want to, right? So there are a set, there are a set of things about assisted living that may be really good. So you want to be thinking about those things. So I'm going to have, um, I'm going to ask Sarah now to come back up to talk a little bit about that. And then I'm going to ask Josh, whom I've already called Jeff at least one time, because, you know, I have senior moments every day, every day, to talk a little bit about se how seniors helping seniors could help out. And then, and then Josh is going to ask Christine to talk broadly about how you could be how they could help you at age 80 and I'm going to come back and talk a little bit about law Sarah do you she doesn't have senior moments right oh gosh no. I have them every single day all day long all right so disclaimer I'm not the one who made this slide I think it's a little bit better than the first time we saw it but the writing is hard to read so I apologize so at age 80 Probably health, health is not quite at what, what it was when it was you were 70. You might have more mobility issues, getting in and out of the shower may be more difficult, getting on and off the toilet. Cooking may be harder if your vision isn't the same. Cooking, even cognitive changes may make it so you don't remember to put the sugar in the cake and it comes out disgusting. So. All of those things make living at home a little bit more difficult. Your laundry is in the basement, you have to walk up and down the stairs. So one of the things that a care manager might do with you is look at all of that. What's making life difficult? And then help you problem solve. How could this be fixed? Can it be fixed where you are? Are you willing to have someone come in you know, twice a week, make healthy meals that you put in the freezer so all you have to do is microwave them. Meals on Wheels, you contact Baypath and see if you can connect with that to get your meals that way. Uh, 
different kinds of agencies, either the non-traditional, if, you, if you're pretty isolated, it's hard to get around, even hard to get to the doctors. Maybe you contact seniors helping seniors. We connect you with that so that you can have someone bring you to the appointments. We might even go with you to the appointments as an extra set of ears, an extra person to ask questions. I know even as a nurse, I often find that doctors talk too fast and they think we all understand all the medical lingo. And even I don't. So I often will go in and say, all right, slow down. Talk to me, make me understand this better. So helping do that. Sometimes that's very helpful if your kids, Peter, Paul, Mary Jr., are living in California. It's reassuring for them to know that the information they're getting from mom and dad from the doctor's appointment is actually what the doctor said. I know I often hear from my parents, everything's great. I hear that from my dad. And then my mother gets on the phone and gives me this litany of all the issues that my dad's having. So it's kind of nice to, you know, if, if they were further away, I get to be close, but if they were further away to have someone that helps bring those two stories a little bit closer together. Um, laundry, helping you find somebody, you know, from an agency or somewhere to help do laundry, cooking, uh, maybe connect you with a adult day health program. Maybe the senior center doesn't quite have what you need or if you're starting to have some cognitive issues, either Frank or Mary, and, you know, let's say Frank is having the cognitive issues is starting to wander or is driving Mary crazy, asking the same question every day and she just needs a little time to herself every once in a while. There are, there are a lot of nice adult day programs that range from managing mild um, cognitive issues, a social model to a more medical model that have dementia programs, cognitive impairment programs, so that the activities are designed to keep people active, engaged, using their brains, that, which helps with their thought process. They also provide meals two days a week. They, um, will bring you back and forth, and it gives the caregiver a break so they can take care of themselves as well. Um, driving retirement, often an issue, either vision, mobility, thought process, ability to think on your feet, move quickly, mobility. Um, it can be a really difficult discussion. Care managers often will have those discu difficult discussions or initiate some of those d difficult discussions with you or your family. There are programs that can test your ability to safely drive. Um, we can be the bad guys, so your kids don't have to be the bad guys. Um, there was something else I was gonna think about, I was gonna say, and I had my senior moment. So that's it, so now it's Josh's turn. <laughs> Um, so, um, as Sarah was just saying, uh, it, it is really important to, um, you know, have a care manager or have an advocate or have somebody else involved in your care besides yourself or even besides your spouse. Um, cognitive changes can make things more challenging and um, we know that cognitive challenges and cognitive diseases, uh, increase in prevalence as we age. So it's important that um, you're not doing this alone, right? When you have a child, you, you want all the help you can get. You want people bringing you food. You want people babysitting. You need that time for yourself. The same really goes for the end of life and towards the end of life in terms of caregiving. Um, so you have the care manager, you have your care team, and your care team can be um, a team of professionals, it could be your primary care physician, it could be a social worker, um, it could be anyone who's kind of on your side looking out for you, and then obviously your family, um, and family um, can be in involved or not as involved depending upon the relationship and de depending upon the, the geographic location. Um, so, you know, in closing, I think it, 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 you need to kind of ensure that you have the key stakeholders in your life lined up 
because aging and the things that we encounter are often bumpy. And to have that support system already built up, already designated, will make um, your life better and help you have the best quality of life till the end. So now I'm going to turn it over to Christine. I really have to echo what Josh says. I've, um, since the beginning of the year, I've been a long distance caregiver for my mother. I've been going back and forth to New Jersey very frequently, and we did not have good systems set up. Uh, my mom is fiercely independent, but now she can't drive. So we had to try and figure out, all right, how are we gonna get groceries delivered? She does not have the internet. So when she needs groceries, she writes a list, puts it in the mail, sends it to me in Massachusetts, I get on my iPad, and ShopRite delivers the groceries. And what does my mother have on her list? Ice cream, cookies, frozen pizza, Cheez-Its. And I said, Ma, do you have anything that's healthy on this list? I have salad. Okay, so for staying at home, state home care program, as again, no income limit, provides a myriad of services and supports. So if you need help doing laundry because it's in the basement and you can't get down those stairs, if you need help with grocery shopping because you can't get out, we can help you solve those issues because we contract with providers in the community who come in and provide those services to you. Some of the new programs that are, will be covered under the State Home Care Program, a new program called the Capable Program, which is a nurse, an occupational therapist, and a handyman coming in and helping you looking at your living environment and see how some home modifications may make it more accessible and user-friendly to you. Arthur mentioned uh, no-cost home, home, home loans. We can give you information on that as well. There are home modification loan, uh, loans available. Some have interest, some don't, but that's information and referral. Information and referral, I just said, can give you information on virtually anything and any state. We can refer you to people in other states. Options counseling is a program whereby we, you meet with a trained counselor who can talk to you about options for staying in the community. If you're on mass health, what might be available? You don't, because many people think they have to go right to a nursing home, and that's not correct. There are many programs to help you stay in the community, in the setting of your choice. And I mentioned a little bit earlier the caregiver program. So again, the services under state home care, case management, your case manager works with you to determine your services and get your service plan set up. Personal care, homemaking, grocery shopping, medical transportation, adult day health, laundry, respite, home health aid, skilled nursing, personal emergency response system, and that is not all inclusive. That is only a sampling. So if you think you know someone, a spouse, a neighbor, could they use some state home care services? Call and make a referral. We go out and see the person, and we can then do an assessment to see what they are eligible for and what will help them stay at home. So I'm going to turn this back to Arthur. Thank you, Christine. So the main thing to know if you're Frank and Mary and you're at 80, and you're 80, and you get any of these issues is you call all these people, they're not going to charge anything to talk to you, right? They may, you know, in, in, in Sarah's case or, you know, or in Josh's case, if you decide to actually do the, you use the services, you may get, you're going to get charged for that. All, most of Christine's services or the ones that she refers to are state funded or federally funded. So the main thing is just to ask, just to ask and see if, there, if, if, you're, if there's an aspect of your life or your spouse's life or a friend's life down the street that isn't really working out well and they're kind of like adapting but not great, then you really should be talking to those folks. So I want to go back. At, so Frank and Mary, I'm assuming, still have the same assets that they had at 70. They were still frugal. They stayed healthy for 10 years. They didn't spend a lot of money, so they've got the same assets. Total value um, three, six, eight hundred thousand dollars. So a couple of things. If Frank or Mary do need home care, which is not being provided by Christine, 
because Christine's program or the Bay Path program, which is state funded, there is a limit on the number of hours you're going to be able to get at home, right? Now, as she mentioned, it's not asset based and there's no income limit. So you could do that, but it, and if you needed additional hours, that would be okay. You're not gonna get cut off from hers because you're buying some additional ones. You just wanna remember that, well, First of all, if you have a long-term care insurance policy, you should always talk to those folks because they may be willing to pay for some of those hours. Christine talked about the state-funded program. Um, tax deductibility. If, if, if you need that kind of assistance at home and in the opinion of your doctor or a nurse or a social worker, you need that assistance because you need regular assistance with at least two of the activities of daily living, eating, bathing, dressing, toileting, transferring, or you need someone to be with you a lot because you have some cognitive issues. All of those expenses may very well be tax deductible. And that's really important if, you're, if, you're using, if we're using Frank's IRA money. You know, the great reason why nobody ever wants to use their IRA or 401k money as they get older is then it's income to them. They have to pay tax on it. But if you're using it for this, as effectively, you're, you're getting to use 100% of the dollars because you're taking $10,000 out of the IRA to pay the home care people, but then, and so that was income, but then you've got a $10,000 medical deduction because, because as long as you can get that certification that you need that kind of care. So you, you wanna think about that, you wanna talk to your accountant about that, talk to your lawyer about that, um, but the main thing is there are ways of getting that kind of care. Finally, um, and I, I want to talk about this program a little bit more in detail, even though it may not apply to Frank and Mary, because I want you to appreciate that even Frank and Mary at 80, they haven't done any advanced planning. They all own all of their assets. If, if one of them needed nursing home care, or specifically here, if one of them needs a lot of care at home, then they can qualify for Mass Health. In order to, to be eligible for the Frail Elder Waiver, you need to show that medically you need a lot of care at home because somebody is certifying that you need help with at least two of the activities of daily living or that you've got a cognitive impairment. But if that's the case, here's the story. If Mary can demonstrate those things, and you saw what their assets were, Mary can qualify as soon as she has less than $2,000 in countable assets. At that point, there is an income cap on this program, but Mary's income is below the Mary's income is below the income cap. Frank's asset Frank's income will not be counted, and Frank can own the home no matter what the equity in the home. Can have other cash or cash equivalent assets equal to one hundred twenty six thousand four hundred twenty dollars, and can have unlimited income. And Mary can shift those assets to Frank the day before she applies for this program. It's the same thing as applying for Mass Health if you're in a nursing home. You can transfer assets to your spouse the day before you apply. There's no look back period, none of that. So what Frank would do in this case is every, all assets would be shifted to, to, to Frank, assuming that Frank has a power of attorney from Mary in case Mary can't sign and that that a power of attorney allows unlimited gifting He's then gonna be able to keep the house. he keep up to $126,420 of the other assets, use all the rest of the money to buy an annuity. As long as that annuity call for equal monthly payments over a term that is shorter than his life expectancy, he can buy that annuity in any amount, in any amount. We've done annuities by spouses for a million dollars to qualify the other spouse for one of these programs. So. And, we, and, and that shifting that we just talked about, there's no look back period. The, the, the spouse can buy, the, we can shift the assets to, in, to the other spouse in day one. Day two, the, the, that other spouse can buy the annuity, thereby reducing, in this case, his assets below that magic number, 126,420. The day after that, Mary can qualify for these programs. So it's, it's very simple. You'd, obviously, you'd wanna talk to a lawyer about it because you wanna make sure the asset shifting gets done right. Mass Health isn't necessarily going to tell you that you can do this asset shifting. They'll just tell you that you don't qualify yet. They don't want to tell you that there is a way that you can. Um, another, one other thing regarding assisted living, which we had talked about earlier, assuming that you're not qualifying for Mass Health, and Mass Health never pays for assisted living, um, but, but you should always look at it. Frank and Mary should always be looking at that. If Mary's having trouble getting around, 
if if there were just some issues if in terms of isolation that they think would be much they'd be much better in assisted living do not dismiss assisted living out of hand first of all talk to your geriatric care manager that's another one of her jobs she's supposed to know all the assisted livings in this area which one might be a fit for you which ones won't right then do the do the numbers but once again let's make make some assumptions assume that the assisted living is eight thousand dollars a month that pays for a very good assisted living i think that's higher than the price of the assisted living down you know down the street from you right right here in ashland the uh what is it called what not what have you the other one the valley farm yeah i think i think valley farm Right. So this, so this is a reasonable number. Say that Frank and Mary are both there, so they're paying $8,000 a month. Frank and Mary's income is $3,000 a month. But remember, once you're in assisted living, your other expenses go way down because you're not doing the house and you're not paying for the meals. You can have a car there if you want, and that's going to be a cost, right? But you don't have to. If you don't want to, they have transportation. So figure that in this situation, Frank and Mary's burn rate, the rate at which their savings is going to go down, after they've paid their social security checks to the assisted living is about five thousand dollars a month or about sixty thousand dollars a year if they had and i'm assuming that they're using some of their other assets to just continue living remember they had total assets of eight hundred thousand dollars if they kept sixty of it or six hundred thousand of it to take care of this that means they've paid for their assisted living for ten years that's longer than their actuarial life expectancy do not dismiss assisted living, right? Um, one other thing. So remember, the reason why folks start talking about, um, you know, kind of doing this kind of structural changes when they get to these ages is this. You know, if you're 65, your likelihood of ending up with a, a disease that causes dementia and spending some time in a nursing home is about one out of nine. If you're 85, it's one out of three. So it's, there's more of a concern. If you're Frank and Mary at this age, you don't have to worry about shifting assets out of your name right now. What you do want to worry about is that if you die, your spouse is safe. If you're worried about that, there's a very simple solution to it. You change your will to say that when you die, any of the assets that you would have left to your spouse and said go and trust for the benefit of your spouse. If you do that, then any assets you own at death go into trust for the spouse's benefit will instantly be non-countable and non-leanable if your spouse needs to qualify for mass health. And then, like, you, like Frank and Mary would have wanted, once, the two, once both of spouses have died, whatever's left in that trust is going to get divided among the kids. So there's simple things that you can do. You don't have to lose control if you're Frank and Mary and you're 80. You just have to pay attention. Uh, if we've been talking too fast, I have that bad habit. Um, and you want to see this again, first of all, this is going to be on local cable. If you want to see it multiple times because you just love Frank and Mary, uh, all of these shows are on Frank and Mary's website, Elder Law Frank, uh, Frank and Mary, on, on their YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Any questions for any of these folks or for me? Any questions? Yeah, yes, ma'am.